So before we even get started, um, because my presentation today is, is directed towards men, although I love to give, um, I feel like when the opposite gender is watching, there's so much we learn when it's when something is focused and directed towards one particular group. There's a, there's a whole lot that we can learn by listening in. So I'm, I love that there's so many more women in the room than men because this is very focused on men. But of course, there are plenty of people that'll watch it later. I think we live in a, in a world where there's so much mental activity. Everything is designed for the mind. Science needs proof, and we leave out this other world of um, the unseen and the invisible. And our heart lives within, within that dimension. And what I've been noticing through my, my work, my coaching work with men, is that there is a trend towards an absolute desire for an emotional connection that through the man box, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, that most men are a part of. It's the way that we women, you know, we've always known we live in a box from the time we're little girls, we're aware that, that, that there's something that we, we have to work harder at to have the same. So there's an awareness of that box for us in our lives. But for men, there is a box that most men don't realize that they're living in. And it's becoming very, very crippling, especially around the heart and the emotions. So before I say much of anything yet, I just kind of want to drop in here. And have, I just want to connect with each one of you because we don't take time to do that so much in the world. <coughs> you know, we're oriented towards speaking to the mind and giving facts and what can be proven. And we all know what we know that nobody has told us as a fact. We all have those things inside of us that we know are the truth as opposed to your truth or my truth. So just, this is a little bit of heart, the heart, how many of you have heard of the Heart Math Institute? You guys don't know about the Heart Math Institute? Oh my gosh, Heart Math Institute. I have a few of their slides I'm gonna put up. This is so interesting because see, you guys are mostly in the realm of academia. And so there's a lot, this is where I, I, I struggle with science as an absolute because it leaves out a lot of what is the invisible forces in life. And again, our heart is part of that. And I think it was Tesla, I actually wrote it down because I'm terrible at quoting people, but I believe it was Tesla. He said, the day that science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it will make more progress in one decade than in all the previous centuries of existence. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely believe that. I mean, we know he's a genius. Mm -hmm. um, so the Heart Math Institute is all about educating you about the matrices and the wisdom. That's, they don't really use the word wisdom so much, but the heart brain. Mm -hmm. And that the, the heart actually sends um, more signals to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. So look it up, the Heart Math Institute. That's a, that's a, that's a good place to look. But again, <clears throat> I want us to just kind of take a minute and drop in here. Because in this busy life that we live in, running around in LA, LA traffic, zooming, we're in here all the time. So I just want you to literally put both your hands over your heart. And this is part of the Heart Math Institute's way of bringing coherence to the heart. Just close your eyes for a minute. Think of something that you're grateful for. Just one thing. And take three long, slow, deep breaths. And when you finish your three breaths, because everybody has a different length of breath, just open your eyes. Okay, so you notice already how that kind of shifts you into a, a calmer place within yourself. And I just really believe we need to live for more. At the, this idea of what is a heart on, well, first of all, because this is, <clears throat> for me, the world that I live in with my, my teaching, my clients, my writing, it's a lot more about that non-physical phenomena and what I experience directly person to person with the people that I work with. So it's not scientific per se, but it's the truth. <laughs> and I know it to be the truth in my life. So what I really <clears throat> hope to do <clears throat> today for you guys is something that in all the work that I do, I strive to do. I wanna leave you with a lot of questions. I wanna leave you thinking about 
how you do things now that might be a different way of doing things, how to look at them from a different angle outside of the box. Lots of questions, the what's and the why's, just to keep you thinking so that you're thinking about the things we talk about today for weeks to come. And it's, it's, it's having you evaluate how you do things now because we get into a robotic way of doing everything. That's why I love working with different clients. And because I'm not a therapist, I have several friends who got their degrees, went through all their hours of training, and then decided not to get certification because they realized that once they got certification, the governing rules about the territory they could cover with clients became so narrow that it was no longer appealing to them. So in the coaching work that I do, I always tell my clients, I take a stand for you until you can stand for yourself. And I'm incredibly fierce about it. And I'm not afraid to go places where if you're a licensed therapist, you're not allowed to go. So um, for me, it's really important that I'm able to navigate these particular places. And it keeps me in a place of not being robotic because everyone is different. And I'm continually forced to look outside the box and look at what this specific person in front of me really needs to have. So, and I'm, I'm also happy to take questions as we go. I'm kind of a flower. I'm, this is so unusual for me, but we're on a time frame. Usually I like to just go, don't use slides, do the whole thing, be in the moment. So if you have questions as we go, it's not going to interrupt my flow. I'm happy to. Yes? So are you going to be discussing some of these places you go that licensed people can't go, or should we do it now? Well, you, you I mean, <laughs> I, ha I mean, there are topics I need to cover on the syllabus in terms of the talk, but those are certainly things I'm willing to address. I mean, t to answer that specifically, if I, f if I feel that a client needs something in particular, and it's very intuitive in terms of the way that I work with people. I don't think about whether it's right or wrong or rational or scientific. It's very much through here. That's why this concept of when was the last time you had a great heart on is so important. I think men are miserable right now in their sexuality, and especially young men. I work with a lot of young men who have come through, their sexual education has been pornography. And the majority of them have no idea. If I look them in the eye, they start crying. They don't know how to connect with a real woman or a, another man if they happen to be gay, regardless of gender. There is this, this fear and this longing that is so profound and so deep that I see with men. I have a whole other body of work that I do with women around this area, which is why our sexual dissatisfaction, because we're being affected by all of this virtual sexuality, why that dissatisfaction for us is a profound awakening, but that's, that's another day. So what I'm seeing with, with, um, with men, and, and like I said, a lot of the young men that come to me, they've been porn addicted. Uh, some of them, uh, I have had clients who are in their 30s have had sex maybe twice in their whole life. They do everything virtually. They're unable to, to connect and have conversation with women. Sometimes the work I have them do is we go out somewhere and I sit and I instruct them to go and talk, just talk to a woman. And my God, the sweaty palms, the, the anxiety that it provokes because we're living in a world where we're losing touch with each other. We're losing touch with this. And my experience professionally and personally with men is that men have extremely deep and sensitive hearts. And I, I kind of like, I, I, I describe kind of the difference between the masculine and the feminine heart. This hit me one day. As women, we kind of like, we're very comfortable being here. We're not socialized away from our heart the way men are. I'm going to read a quote from someone's book that very succinctly puts that together. But so we, I kind of saw like a cross, but not like a religious cross, just, just a cross. Mm -hmm. And I see women kind of like this on the horizontal axis. We've got all these people in our arms, in our hearts that we love. We live in our hearts. Our hearts get broken. We get back on it. Our hearts are more resilient. From working with men, what I have discovered is this vertical axis, which if you look at it, it's penetrating. It's solid. It's deep, and it is singular. Mm -hmm. I, my experience professionally with men is that there's a longing for a singular kind of love, for someone that they can trust, have deep friendship with, have deep love with, rely on, and to know that sexually they're desired. This going out and hunting for all kinds of sexual conquests my personal opinion isn't true, and it's part of the man box and a bunch of lies that, because men seem to want 
that singular energy. And that's why so many men, if you think about it, teenage boys, oh my God, they're like, they fall in love and they go through the whole thing and, and they pursue you. The heart gets broken and there's something in them that says, I am never doing this again. And so many don't. So many don't. Because their hearts are so, I, I think the masculine heart is a really profound and beautiful place. It's something that is a gift that we are, as women, we've had our own battles to fight. And we don't always pay attention to how we contribute or if from a lack of awareness of the sensitivity of the masculine heart. We don't realize that the things we do or the way we say them or the way we reject a man has this deep imprint that a lot of times doesn't go away. So the heart contracts more and more and more if it's open at all. So let me get back to this because I'll run away from the syllabus so fast. <laughs> so um, so the, here's a heart. This is from the Heart Math Institute. This is one of their little heart brain factoids. Um, so the heart has a system of neurons that both short and long term memory and the signals they send to the brain can affect our emotional experiences. There's a huge relationship between what we feel and our biology. Mm. Are you guys familiar with an author by the name of Candace Pert? Molecules of Emotion? Mm. Oh, I love that I'm bringing you things you haven't heard of because I think it'll serve, it'll serve all of you. I'll get to her in a second. So the heart sends more information to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. Coherent heart rhythms help the brain in creativity and innovative problem solving. This I love. Your heart emits an electromagnetic field that changes according to your emotions, and others can pick up the quality of your emotions through the electromagnetic energy radiating from your heart. We feel, <coughs> we feel each other. It doesn't matter so much what we say. We feel each other. There's this resonance and this vibration and this harmonizing that takes place from our hearts. But men are incredibly socialized away from this feeling place at a very, very early age. So the whole idea of emotions, first of all, this is something that occurred to me one day, um, that we've made emotions masculine and feminine instead of universally human and free of gender. Because what's hap what happens is, as women, we're allowed sort of to, to live and play in the full spectrum of emotions, except one. Anybody know what that one is in general? Anger. Exactly. And that's the one that guys get to have. And when I say get to have, I'm talking about how society defines masculine and feminine. So in order for the masculine to really be masculine, you don't have an emotion. You don't have emotions or you don't express them. The one you get to express you know, outwardly and in front of others is anger. So this is part of what I talk about as being the man box. It's this structure, construct, invisible construct, that from a very early age, men are taught. I remember my father, um, my brother being very little and, my, and crying and being told, you know, stop crying, be a man. And I think those are words that men hear a lot. And my brother was three or four years old. So it starts with them really small, the way we're taught, the way women are taught, be nice, be nice, be nice. You know, we get put into the nice box really early on. People please. But guys get taught when they're children. You know, don't have feelings, repress that, suppress that. And it becomes part of this man box that you live in. And, and this is where I think it's very um, insidious because a lot of men don't realize this is a box. You don't realize that this is something that's driving you because it happens from a very early age. And the depression and the sense of loneliness and longing that I'm really seeing in the masculine heart and with my male clients. And like I said, from a very early age, and a lot of this is very much <coughs> tied to sexuality. I think there's a huge relationship between the erectile dysfunction, the premature ejaculation, because there's a lot of body wisdom talking to you there, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but I wanna share something, because um, this is all very much body-mind connection. So I mentioned Candace Pert. This is one of hers. The chemicals that are running our body and our brain are the same chemicals that are involved in emotion. And that says to me that typo, we better pay more attention to emotions with respect to health. Now Candace Perth was a pharmacologist that came out of Johns Hopkins and she was a pioneer in body-mind medicine. She was also part of, um, was it Bill Moyer's um, uh, healing in the mind. 
I read her book, Molecules of Emotion, about 10 years ago, and I was just blown away mm -hmm. because it was almost mystical. And again, it's kind of like what Tesla said about non-physical science and Einstein and a lot of these great minds that we look up to were mystics in their private life because they understood the importance of non-physical science. Like I said, here in the West, we, we, we measure what we can measure is the only thing that we validate. Mm -hmm. What we can measure is what we find valid. And we discard the rest. And we are socialized not to trust ourselves because we're constantly relying on the expert. I really don't like that word. <laughs> I say to everybody, my clients too, I said, no matter what I tell you, go out and do your own research. You know, really learn to trust yourself. Don't trust me. Trust me, yes, I'm here to serve you in a certain kind of way. But be your own existential detective and pay attention and go out there and do the things that are going to validate what you need for yourself. And plus, I mean, we know with the internet how much misinformation is out there anyway. There's a quote from this person or a quote from that person. I, ever since I was little, this is the reason I got put in school at three years old, questions drive my life. Questions to me are more important than the answers because the questions take you on the journey. You find the answer and the answer is not nearly as important as the journey and the question that incited it, you know? So question everything, but don't question yourself. And that's the, that's the, the flip of the way things is. It's like question yourself all the time or don't question yourself, just trust me, the expert. So I'm not very fond of, of, of the label of expert. Even when people try to pin it on me, I'm not very fond of it. So, um, so Candace Pert really validated the idea that the receptors in our brain and in our bodies, they're like lock and key, and that whatever we feel or think generates a particular cocktail in our body. That's why in terms of the body-mind medicine, if you're thinking positively and as opposed to negatively, you're going to generate a whole lot of different chemicals in your body and hormones than if you're thinking negatively. They've shown even a smile versus a frown, your body produces different chemicals. She was really, really big. I really love her work, Molecules of Emotion. And it really kind of, for me, validated a way I had been doing my life anyway, which was believing in the power of my mind and what I think and see, you know, becomes my reality. And so reading her book, I mean, truly, there's mysticism in that book as well as pure science. So I highly recommend it because especially, I'm not an addiction expert by any means. I have a lot of clients who are in recovery and per people in my life personally are in recovery. But I do know that if you can get people to change the way that they think and look at things and change their belief systems, it changes a lot, you know, about everything. But here's another one by Candace Pert. My research has shown me that when emotions are expressed, which is to say that the biochemicals that are the substrate of emotion are freely flowing, all systems are united and made whole. I love that. When emotions are repressed, denied, not allowed to be whatever they may be, our network pathways get blocked, stopping the flow of the vital, feel-good, unifying chemicals that run both our biology and our behavior. And I think that this is something that's happening to men in terms of their hard-ons versus heart-on and erectile dysfunction and premature ejaculation. Because what's happening is the feelings that are happening for a lot of men around their sexuality, around their masculinity, about their humanity. Because while we rightly deserve as women to be blowing up all the boxes we've been living in for our whole lives, there's a whole other world going on for men that's very quiet and insidious. And it's, it's having a huge impact and has for a long time. And one of the aspects of that that I feel is very important is the fact that in the West, men are deprived of platonic affection. Now, as, as women, <clears throat> we grow up, we play in each other's hair. We still, I mean, at the ages that we all are here, we don't have any problem cuddling with another woman, touching, holding hands, being affectionate. We don't perceive that as a sexual experience. That is not something that's sexual. We know how to separate affection from sexual touch. So from that early age where boys are socialized away from their feelings, the idea of physical contact with other boys and men um, is shunned by the man or the boy himself and by society, which keeps you inside of that man box. Um, Not in the Latin culture. 
I was just, oh well, no, absolutely. I, that's why I said here. It's, it's a particularly American prob problem. I've traveled, I've probably been to 20 different countries, and it is a particularly American issue. Latin cultures in particular, which I am a huge part of because I dance Argentine tango, um, which I'm going to share a little bit about how that can help men really get into their heart also. But um, it's particularly American. And um, I don't see it really even in other cultures outside of here, but it is really particularly an American male issue. But there's a, I want, before I talk a little bit more about that, there is a, do you guys know who Daphne Rose Kingma is? You might know who she is in this. Okay, good. <laughs> see, I leave, leave you with lots of questions, lots of things to go out and explore. So Daphne Rose Kingma, she is a therapist and a relationship expert, and she coined something, the term called the male heart wound. And it's from a book called The Men We Never Knew. And I saw this passage, and I thought it would be nice to share with you because it kind of encapsulates a lot of the foundation of what I'm talking about today, why men are struggling so much with, this, with, with the, their sexuality. So again, this is Daphne Rose Kingma. Uh, the Male Heart Wound, it's from a section in the book called The Male Heart Wound, and the book is called The Men We Never Knew. And here's the quote. Obviously, male children feel and feel deeply, but eventually socialization takes care of all that. The feeling boy is gradually molded into the unemotional man. This culture destroys the sensitivity in men. It annihilates the male emotionally, sexually, spiritually, and creatively. Men have been encouraged only not to have feelings, but have also been specifically instructed to shove down whatever random tendrils of feelings should, from time to time, manage to crop up. This need for men to not feel is so universal that it has become basically our definition of what it is to be a man, mm -hmm. a big part of the man box. Men carry their pain in their bodies, in their faces, and in their self-destructive habits. Alcoholism, drug addiction, and sex addiction rates are higher for men than for women. Men drop dead of heart attacks and suffer early deaths at higher rates than women. Without having developed a grounded, core sense of self, men truly are lost and treat themselves in disconnected ways far more self-destructively than women. Men, even more than women, have a lack of tolerance of emotional pain. They become addicted to running from pain and discomfort, disconnecting and distracting. The growing presence of chemical solutions like Prozac and its family of prescription drugs adds yet another avenue to avoid dealing with the monster. Men don't want to feel. If they did, what they would uncover might question and erode the foundation and the structures on which they have built their identities and their lives. One of the fundamental things men learn is that they are disposable. A boy walks on the outside of the road with a girl on the inside. <clears throat> it's not a great tragedy if he gets killed. Men get the message that their lives don't count. To have a conversation with a man about self-care is almost an affront. And this is what I truly feel in my work with men. I feel that there's this, this um, sense of not being valuable. And especially with everything that's happening with, with women now, with Me Too and us really coming into our power, a power that's been suppressed for centuries, repre repressed for centuries. And with us, getting, <laughs> with us getting that kind of attention, men feel very displaced about where they fit into all of this at this point in time, what to do, how to do as we become more and more powerful. But back to the, um, the platonic affection. I wrote a piece about how I, f I feel that um, is, is the lack of platonic affection among men contributing to the violence in our world. And I really do believe that if men could be allowed, and I put allowed in quotes, to hang out with their boys and to touch and to connect and to kiss. I was in Europe all summer, and I was in Sicily, which, which is where I'm planning to live a large portion of my life. <laughs> I was literally moved to tears on multiple occasions watching these men. I saw these guys, I was sitting in a restaurant one night by myself having dinner, which is a weird thing to do. I don't think twice about having dinner by myself here, but everybody, it's family and, and connection over there, right? And I'm like, I'm the only person in a restaurant by myself. But it gave me a chance to observe. 
and I saw these three gorgeous, beefy, Italian, Sicilian guys sitting at a table. And another one came in, and he walked over, and he sat on his friend's lap, and he rubbed his head, and he kissed his head. And I was like, oh my god, this is so awesome. Look at these guys. Mm -hmm. And nobody was going to question their masculinity. Mm -hmm. There was something so incredibly masculine about that, that masculine heart. I actually have some of my clients do things like, because I'm always trying to find experiential ways for people to get the message. You can talk at people all day long and give them your theories and tell them what they should do. But I always say that the, the longest journey we take is the distance from here to here, from knowledge to wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I think the only way we get that is through experience, which is why I think a lot of times talk therapy is, doesn't work. And a lot of people I've worked with say they've been in therapy for 10 years, and then we get to the root of it really fast, and they're able to move forward because it's, it's talking, and it's not going to really do anything for you. So sometimes I have my clients do things like, my male clients, do things like watch Braveheart or Men of Thrones, because those characters they cry, they talk to each other about their feelings, and yet there's this strong sense of masculine purpose that they have. Mm -hmm. and, and it gives them an opportunity to kind of see what that looks like, because especially these young guys, the older guys are, are in the man box in a different kind of way. It's about very much what being a man looks like, but there's less of a, how do I say it? There's less of a connection to their emotional side, for sure. The younger guys want to feel, do feel, don't know how to do it, but there's a longing for it in them. The older guys I see more shut down, more jaded, that vertical axis of, of the cross, um, they're really contracted, and it, they've given up on the idea of opening up. So it's a different generation, and it's a different way of not being in the heart. So when I have these guys look at what it looks like, because they'll say to me, well, I don't really even know how to be in my heart. And I'm, I'm not surprised. You don't know where your heart is. You haven't been in it your whole life. And, and when it comes to masculine sexuality, the whole porn thing is destroying a generation of men. And it's destroying the women along with it because we don't really want to be, pornography in general, has misogynistic and violent tendencies towards it. So if a woman wants that, and that's why there's so much dissatisfaction sexually for, for, for certainly the younger generation of women, 20s, 30s, even 40s, because the pornography culture is making it so that we're not having an intimate, soul-stirring experience in our sexuality with one another. We're not connecting. We don't look at each other in the eye. We walk around like this. When I was in Europe and when I travel all over the world, there are very few places where I see anyone doing that. Everyone is here for hours without question. We're here with each other. And this That's is, the way they're raised. it is, yeah. but even though the Western culture is penetrating them, there's still the prioritization mm -hmm. of our humanity and our connection to one another. And the value, I feel it in the heart. I really feel it in the heart. And again, you know, I, I, another little example, and when I was in Sicily, I saw this young boy. And this really touched me, because what, the work that I do with young men, he was only about, I don't know, about 11 years old. And he was sitting at a table with his mother, his father, probably his aunt, and his sister. And I watched him for the better part of a half an hour, get up out of his chair, walk over, throw his arms around his father, Watch his father embrace him back. 11-year-old boys here, that's not happening. Mm -hmm. There's already this going on. It's been going on for a while. He would go over to his mother. He would do the same thing. Then he would go to his sister. And his sister, there was so much love being passed around that it was startling to me because you don't see it here. It's like recognizing the value of something because you never see it. It's kind of an obverse reaction. And you go, oh my God, what is this, you know? But I was literally moved to tears just watching this interaction and watching the boys and the men. That's what really got to me, was the way the fathers carried their babies, the way they loved and nurtured them, the way the men were with one another. And so back to this idea of platonic affection, 
I think there's a rage that's built up in men about not being able to just want to hug, to just want to be close to a woman without feeling like he has to perform. It's pushed down and it's exploding out in violence because there's a d denial of the, that human need that every man has the right to. And so one of the things I try to invite men to do is to get out of all the time, I get out of the man box by being aware that you're in the man box. I mean, when was the last time you actually thought about your own heart or your own feelings? Like, what do I feel as opposed to what do I have to do? What has to be done? Where's the, it, there's no sense of need, like Daphne Rose Kingma's quote about, you know, having a conversation with a man about self-care is almost an affront. You guys don't need anything and you're disposable. You're just here to serve. Where's, what's your value beyond being able to serve? And I think it's really a tragedy. And I think it's something that for men to really awaken to this idea that I have feelings and I'm gonna let my feelings show and I'm gonna be present to them. And I'm going to connect with other men through my heart. It seems like it's easier in my work with clients it's easier for them to sort of process those initial need for emotional connection with me. It feels safer to them. It's a little bit more uh, uh, difficult to do that with other men. What are they gonna think of me? Are they gonna think I'm gay? Are they gonna you know, think I'm weak? How do I actually feel about myself, you ask? How do I feel about myself for having feelings, for letting myself, is this weak? This judgment about having feelings because we put this these labels we put vulnerabilities it, it is seen as a weakness but vulnerability this is one of the things I like to talk about also and thank you for bringing that up is vulner without vulnerability it's it's like to me this is vulnerability I'm standing here yeah so anybody could come up to me and stab me choke me I'm I'm, I'm completely willing to receive right. This is, this is not vulnerability or you know, protection. But without this, you can't receive anything. So, but men are really raised that the idea of vulnerability is I can be attacked, I have to protect myself. It's this war mindset of protecting oneself. And the vulnerability of exposing yourself, that's all I'm really saying with vulnerability, is can you be you? I know. There is an absolute fear to that. And in some ways, I think it's, it's worse than what women fear. We have a vulnerability around being our authentic selves also because it has more to do with us needing to people please. And when we're in our strength and our power, the judgment of being a bitch or all of these, these negatives that come, which is designed to keep us under in terms of our power. So the power over the patriarchy has kept us from expressing power from within, which is what women are prone to do in a collective, collaborative way. <clears throat> but there's this fear for men of being in your authentic masculine, which requires that your big, beautiful hearts are a part of it, that your singularity and your passion and your commitment, which is penetrating, it is gorgeous, and I really feel very lucky that I've been able to witness that personally and professionally in men. It is gorgeous. But where's your motivation to be that way in this world we live in when you're not even allowed access to this gorgeous treasure that lives within you? And the people around you don't acknowledge that you have this treasure. It's up to you to bring that forward. It's up to you to be authentic, to blow up the freaking man box and be who you are. It, for me in my work, this is what it comes down to, to men and women, be who you are. Mm -hmm. Be who you are, be authentic in who you are. In my women's work, I'll say sometimes people say, what do you do? I say, well, I'm a stripper, but we don't take off clothes. We peel away the layers of society, self, gender, everything that keeps us from being our bare, natural, authentic selves. But I think that's the goal with all of us. But the struggles I'm witnessing with men are really, really deep. Now, to bring the body-mind piece to certain 
dysfunctions like erectile dysfunction and premature ejaculation. And I put dysfunction in quotes because we are so wont to take anything that happens and give it a scientific name and a pill to make the symptom go away so we don't face what's going on inside. I think the body, and I think Candace Pert, it's one of her quotes also, that the, the body is the subconscious mind. So whatever your body is acting out for you is really a testament to what's going on <coughs> inside of you, whether you're dealing with it or not. It's like sometimes I liken us as a house. And just because you don't want to look at a piece of furniture, you put it in the basement, it doesn't mean it's not still in the house. So there is this, I lost my train of thought, forgive me one second. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, so in relationship to how this, these dysfunctions are really actual kind of awakenings and opportunities for a man to get in touch with his authentic feelings, I really believe that, for instance, ED, if you can't get it up or can't keep it up, maybe that's your body wisdom saying, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to be with this person? That's body wisdom to me. And instead, what do we do? You have a problem. You have an ailment. Here's a pill. Now you can get it up whenever you want it. But instead, you don't deal with what's in the basement, which you've been dragging around for your entire life as a man, which is what you feel. Maybe you don't want to perform right now. Maybe you don't feel sexual. Maybe this is part of the man box where you think you have to pursue this woman. Maybe you really care about this woman and you're terrified because you don't feel good about yourself. Whatever reason you can't get it up bears examination from within. And women. I think most women, if you're in a relationship with a man where this is happening, I think most women are fairly sensitive about that and not, I know there are plenty of women who wouldn't be, but I think for the most part women are. So this is something that men really struggle with. But I really believe this is part of your body wisdom. And instead of thinking, oh, there's something wrong with me, I'm supposed to have an erection all the time and it's supposed to last, you know, however long, last it longs when I take a Viagra pill. And those drugs, scare the hell out of me personally. I really think that they are preventing men from having an authentic experience in their sexuality and with themselves. And it's just driving these repressed emotions deeper and deeper and deeper into the ground. And it's gonna come out, heart attacks, strokes, side effects from these drugs. If you have a problem with an erection and you've, I mean, come on, come on, there's aging, there's there are physical reasons for it. I'm, I'm talking in this container about not having an actual physical problem. Maybe, and, and even young men, I've worked with clients in their 20s and early 30s who will say to me, oh, I take a Viagra every time before I have sex, just in case. Yeah. Especially for him, if he doesn't know the woman, he has no problem sexually. He's very excited. Yep. Once he, even if he's attracted to the woman, once he gets into the relationship with her, her attraction starts to go down, as does his penis. Right. And so he's very disturbed by it because he wants the idea of a relationship and to be able to function sexually in a relationship. But what ends up happening time and time again for him, as he describes it, is he gets performance anxiety. And so now he just started with the Viagra. And uh, you know, my thought is, as well, this is a pill to take it's away It's not going to fix it. But what's, yeah. you know, that's not going to take away the problem. And, and part of it is that he's in a pattern of choosing women that that's going to keep happening because it's a belief system he has about himself. Mm -hmm. So he's going to continue to validate that by his choices. So until he ends up with someone that's different because he's worked on himself. That's how he's going to know. This is different. That's how, that's how you really know. That's the litmus test for whether you have worked through or are working through a pattern in a significant enough way to provoke change is you get a different outcome. Like, you know, there's a tenet. If you're not getting the results you want on the outside, go back in and do more work. 
So he has to really, we kind of third person things a lot. We all do it. You know, we're ending a relationship or they did, they, 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 they. And I'm like, hello, here's the mirror. It's you. It's always you. It's never anybody else but you. Sorry to tell you, but it's always you. So when we get in there and we're having that kind of an experience, there's a vulnerability that he has about surrendering and about being able to really be intimate because people, I hate that people call sex intimacy. Oh, we were intimate. It's not what it means, you know? It's, and, and, the way, and the way we are doing sex, this is another part, the casual sex thing. I don't think sex is ever casual. To hook up the most intimate parts of two people, or more, depending on what you're into, is not casual. It's never gonna be casual. And you can tell yourself it is. I have a 23-year-old daughter, and I look at how her generation does. It's so hook up. The apps, swipe left, swipe right, meet somebody, have sex. It's like, oh, let's go get a burger. It's lost meaning. It's lost the idea that sex is supposed to be this powerful, soul-stirring, life-affirming experience. We've really lost touch with that. And the more we minimize its value, the easier it is to just do it. I really believe that what's happening for the most part, the way the mainstream is doing sex, is we're just masturbating with each other's bodies. Nobody's home. You might as well be, you're alone with this other person. You're using their body to masturbate. That's what it looks like. Because we're not present here. And I believe that when men are allowing themselves access here. Initially, like for instance with this client you mentioned, initially it is so terrifying to come back in contact with a place that you were told to shove away since you were a little boy. It is terrifying. You feel so vulnerable. And the way that I always know with clients when I've accessed this place is there are tears. Da Vinci said, tears are not from the mind, they're from the heart. And that's why men don't cry. That's why most men don't cry, because they don't have a, a main line to hear. We do. Women know. I always, I always joke and I say, tears are the windshield wipers of the soul. It's like, you know, I'm originally from New Orleans and my family used to be driving back and forth, going through Texas before all the genetically modified insects and everything and the crops. Lots of bugs on the windshield, right? You spray the water, the tears, you wipe it away. We know this as women. We know how cathartic it is. And it's scientifically proven also that the tears, you release a stressor. There are chemicals that go through your body when you cry. Men are told from the time they're little boys not to cry. So when I'm working with a client and I get tears, I love to make men cry. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible, but it makes me really happy because we got there. We, we got there. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Now if I can just get you to stay here. Because the fear that comes from re, from, it's like I said, when you, when men recognize the value and the treasure of their heart, you, you don't give it away so carelessly. I think it's why it's harder for men to fall in love. Like I said, we're like this. Oh, I got all these people and I love them all and I'm juggling all these balls. We are amazing multitaskers. That's not a good thing in a lot of ways, but, but in terms of our heart, it's, there's a flow, there's a fluidity to the way that we're always navigating that. But I really, I think that's the beauty of the masculine heart is its singularity. And I think it's a myth that men want to all run around and just have as many women as possible. I think you guys are so much happier when you've got one that you can count on and that you're attracted to. I really believe that even with the young guys. I really believe that. I think it's a, it's a, it's a myth that's part of the man box. And um, so, and even with the young guys that I work with, they want a relationship. And they're trying to figure out how to get it. So erectile dysfunction, is it dysfunction? It's a message from your body. It's a body-mind experience that's saying, take a look at why this isn't working. How do I really feel? Why am I doing this? Am I on remote control? There's so many questions you have to ask yourself. But the most important thing when you don't get an erection and you, and you really want to have one is to just find out what's your intention behind this moment of sexuality. What is your intention? Ask yourself, why am I here? How did I get here? What do I want? What does my heart want? Like that's literally a question. What does my heart want?
that's where my position is. Yeah. I have a long-term relationship, 34 years. That's beautiful. I've been married for 10 years to another man. That's beautiful. And he finally pulled my covers and said, you're not with me when we're trying. Good for him. To be together, and to be intimate with each other, if you want to say. Yeah. That. And I'm not. I'm a client. I'm here to understand, or try to understand what's in my man box, what's right. in my heart. And I'm right. learning a lot today. Yeah. Oh, good. It's starting the process. Good. That's like I said, I want you guys to just, I want your wheels turning. And that's for me as I've done my job, if your wheels are turning. But this is something, too, what you bring up. Um, There's a cause. There is a cause. And that I've created pain in that individual. Yeah. And they've told me that. And I love them. I want not to do that. But the more I need to direct it at myself. I was just going to say that. That you've created pain for them, but the pain that you feel you've created for them has come from the pain within you that you haven't been able to navigate within yourself. And so he's mirroring. It's always mirroring. All of our relationships are just mirroring something we either love and value or don't like in ourselves. So when we think it's them, it's like flip it. It's like, what do I see in the mirror of this person in front of me? You know, and, and it's always true. This is something that I don't care how many times I, in my own personal life relationships I'll hear myself going they, 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 or you, 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 and then I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> it's me. This is me. Let me dig deeper. What don't I want to see? What don't I want to confront? What don't I want to face? And this is beautiful that he called you on it. That's intimacy. That right there to me is intimacy because he's saying, I don't feel you, and I want to feel you. How terrifying is that, right? When someone says, I want to feel you, this, in this day and age, I mean, that's a scary thing. How much do we even make eye contact with people? That's why when I started with you guys, I want to see each and every one of you. It's very important to me in my life and in my work. It's about people. It's about connection. It's about realness. And these sexual dysfunctions of men, I don't believe. I don't believe that they are dysfunctions that require medical management or that require you take a pill. They require self-examination and they require allowing yourself to feel. Same thing with premature ejaculation. I look at that as a body message of hurry up and get out of here. You have no business being here. Hurry up and get out of here. Because here's the thing. Your heart is in communion with your body and even if your mind isn't present, your heart won't betray you. Your body is giving you a message. It's giving you a clear signal that you are not in alignment with your heart. It's an advocate for you not to betray yourself. So these body messages that we get, same thing for women. Women who get like yeast infections and all kinds of um, herpes and um, uh, bladder infections, boundary violations, body messages. Our bodies are talking to us. Are we listening? Do we, are we curious enough to find out what they're trying to tell us? That requires the courage to go in here. It requires the courage to, to go into our hearts. And it's not an easy, it's not, it's the road less traveled, it's not quick and easy, and we live in a culture of hurry up and do it. Hurry up and get it done. Three steps to this, 10 steps to that. There were a couple of big papers, that, uh, online papers that wanted me to write for them, and they wanted everything to be three steps to this, five steps to that. I said, no, I refuse. Because the things that, require, that are most important and valuable in our lives require time and energy and effort. And I will write until it's finished. So no thank you. And it's not easy to do it that way in a world that wants you to do it the other way. The conformity, like blow up the box, blow up the man box, wear your heart. I'm serious, you guys in here, watch, if you haven't seen it in a long time, watch Braveheart, watch Game of Thrones. Those men had a strong sense of purpose, 
power, passion, masculinity, and they were always connected to their hearts with each other and in their expression of love to, to women. So I use that in my work because it gives guys an example. They can't find that out here so much. Where are those guys? Not running around in furs, but just the men who will call you on your stuff, who will invite you into your own heart with each other. It's really a problem in America. It's awful. And we have one of the most violent cultures out there, and I firmly believe that if men were allowed the opportunity to have affection without sex and sex with affection, it would be very different. Mm -hmm. If men could touch and hug and just care for one another. And another piece, a lot of times men want affection from women, but we're so socialized that if a man is touching you, it means sex. As women, we're like, uh-oh, he must want to be sexual with me. As a female. Sure. Yes. Oh, yeah. Like no, but that's what I'm saying. That's actually, that's actually on point with what I'm saying is we have made touch between the genders something that means sex. Mm -hmm. Like, why can't you touch a guy and have him not think, oh, she wants me? Or anything, because even, even genuine, I always go back to something that happened to me in college where I ran into somebody I hadn't seen for a long time, and I was like, oh my god, how are you? It's been so long. And, and then it came back around to me. I was like, oh yeah, I saw Liz. She totally wants to sleep with me. Yeah. I'm like, what? But that's their stuff. Yeah, that's their totally stuff. Their stuff. Yeah. But yeah. it's just like, why? So you can't yeah. just be genuinely happy to see someone? That's always, yeah. that's, and yeah. I think it's part of that whole it is. thing of just like, I don't know what to do with this energy coming at me. But, but the thing is, I think we just have to be responsible with our own energy. When we say, I don't know what to do with this energy coming at me, do what you want to do with it. Right. Be authentic. Let it be true for you. But why can't we just touch each other and have it be affection? Why does it have to mean sex? So sometimes men just want to cuddle. You don't want to have to perform or do anything. But to ask for straight affection in the man box? No, no, no. It's not allowed. And sometimes that's all you want to have. And I just think that if men could with each other, I think men need men's groups to, led by men who are conscious and awake around this area. I personally love working with men's group because there's a way that men open up to, to a woman the way that they wouldn't <laughs> to a man in a different way. So I like working with men, but it's different. I think men need men's groups that are 100% male. So it's a little bit different, but I love doing the work because it allows men to really open up and, and soften and to begin to just kind of access this in a certain kind of way. So, but, I, but those dysfunctions, aren't dysfunctions, and I don't like seeing them that way. And I think all these drugs and medications, um, every single time uh, something happens once or twice, it, now it's a condition, and it needs a drug and a fancy name and a DSM code, code to go with it. What we call, and all of these um, um, antidepressant medications, and, and they're rampant with young people. They're all on antidepressants. And the thing that, the perception I have about antidepressants is what we're doing is there's this whole range of human emotions from here to here. Well now, if you traffic in the end of too high or too low, you have a problem. It can't be that you're joyful or that you have an awakening through a depression. Let's just keep everybody marching in a really simple mid-range. Let's just stay in the middle and never deviate into those areas. I think those highs and lows are important for taking us on these journeys in our lives. I look at depression not as something, I mean, it depends. I mean, people have legitimate, um, Clinical depression. absolutely. But even that I question sometimes because we're so quick with science to put a label on people because we won't take the time to find out if there's something else we can do or another way we can manage it. So the labels I'm not fond of. But those lows, I think, are like dark night of the soul. They're a chance for you to kind of wake up and say, what is going on in my life? I'm miserable. I'm suffering. Don't take a pill and push it away. Don't take a pill and go back into the mainline baseline of emotions that now seems to be the norm. If anybody raises their voice now or 
has a little bit of passion, it's like, oh my God, they've got anger management issues. <laughs> We're so quick to put everybody in a box, in a container. I say, blow up the boxes. Be responsible with your, you know, with your own feelings. But these pills are designed to keep us in a state of conformity and going along with a, a way that we can be managed. And I think that we all have this innate power within us that we need to access. And in order to do that, we have to be aware of the boxes and we have to choose consciously to get out of them. And, and, I, and I really think that in order for men to have these soul-stirring experiences and have these heart-ons, you have to turn your heart on.